It is good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here. You would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, and we'll be looking at verse 13, but a couple of the verses in 15 as well. Then we'll be going back to the book of Exodus. It says in verse 13 of Romans chapter 15, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in that hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The scripture also says in Philippians chapter 4 that we are to rejoice in all things. Again, I say rejoice. Now, I've used that particular verse in Philippians at funerals before to bring them to the point that everything that God does, He's working for our good. And the joy that we would have First, why we could rejoice at a funeral, especially that of a believer. We know that they just got to heaven and they're looking down on us doing their funeral. It's an amazing thing. You get to rejoice and we kind of have it backwards, you know. When a baby comes into the world, we get all excited. Look what that kid's got to go through. We go to a funeral. This, this gracious saint has, has breathed his last breath, but his next breath is celestial. Went to, well, look where they went to. Amen. But we're living here. So when we get hope, it ought to bring a rejoicing spirit to our life. You know, as a Christian, when I look out to the world and see the way it is, I could easily get depressed. But if I look in, to who lives on the throne of my heart, I'm going to find the joy. Because he's led me to his word that says all things work together for our good who are called according to his purpose. His purpose is for us to give ourselves to him in repentance and faith and walk with him every day of our life. The world out there is in a mess. The Lord in here is not. So I get my clues, not from the world, but I get them from Jesus. Amen. So even in the midst of a crisis, I can look at Romans chapter 15, verse 13, and it says, Now may the God of hope, God is the God of hope. He's the God that's over everything, in everything, through everything, and causes all things, by the way. And through those things, we need to learn. One of those things we need to learn is the fact that 2 Chronicles 7.14 does say, repent of your wickedness so God can heal the land. First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sins and he'll, he'll, he'll cleanse you of your sins and forgive you of all your iniquities. So there's a necessity to really know the hope of God, that we've got to stay right with God. There's a necessity to be a, a, a witness to the world in a crisis like this. Our lives have to be right with God. And so we need to be before God daily with our lives, daily in His Word, daily listening to His voice, His voice, so we can be the hope to this world in the midst of a crisis. Priest Monday, Wednesday night out of Matthew 8, chapter 1. Jesus came down the mountain. There's a crowd that gathered around him. And there's this leper that came up to him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He said, I'm willing. And he reached out and touched him. The Bible says of Jesus, when he was walking on this earth, <laughs> that he emptied himself of his glory and took on human flesh. <clears throat> and so Jesus walking on the face of this earth, he's in a body just like mine. But he developed a unique relationship with the Father that he would reach out and touch a man who had leprosy, pray for him to be healed. 
One of the things that I have a hope for me and for you, because we are in that body that Jesus was in, that we get to develop a unique relationship with the Father that lets us reach out and touch instead of back up and distance. Preach. Jesus reached out and touched the man with leprosy. Now, if I was in the New Testament and I had leprosy and someone came toward me, my responsibility would be to say, unclean, unclean. And then I would get as far to this side. You know, even then they practice social distancing. <clears throat> and then the person coming down the road would get as far as they could to this side. So there would be a passing there that the contagious leprosy would not get on the other person. Jesus in his natural body with his unique relationship with God reached out and touched that man. And Jesus went forward. Thank you, brother. I don't know the need of the thanks. Jesus reached out and touched that man. That tells me that if I follow him, I don't have to fear. I have to have faith. And that's the faith that I pray that we'll all discover when we have that unique relationship with God. To do that, let's look at the word of Scripture that says, Now, may the God of hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believe you. Now, God is the one who says he wants to fill us. So would you take your arms and make yourself a bucket? Take your arms and make yourself a bucket. And say, Lord God, fill me with all hope. Fill me with all peace. That I may abound with hope. And touch this world with the healing hand of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's now, may the God of all hope, if you look to God, who's the God of all hope, all hope, Jesus says, I am the Father of one. When you invite Jesus into your life as you repent of your sins and invite him in through faith, Jesus said, I am the Father of one. You've got holy God living in you. He is the Father of one. So if Jesus comes to abide, you've got God. The God of hope lives in you. Now what we have to do in faith as we walk, let the God of hope live out through us. How do we know that God is a God of hope? And how do we know that God watches over us? If you would, turn with me to the book of Exodus. Start in Exodus chapter 7. <clears throat> One of the things I want you to notice about Exodus 7 7 is this. And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. You know, there's an absence, and I'm glad to see young people sitting up here today who have the faith to come and worship. So most churches are absent having any young people in them whatsoever. Look at this. Moses was 80. And Aaron was 83. When they took on the tax to go and stand before Pharaoh. So all of us out here, guess what? God can put an amazing calling on your life even today. So you get to say, Lord, show me what and what great and mighty thing you want me to do and be ready to go forward with that thing that God puts on your heart to do. And you don't have to worry. God uses senior saints to do work just like he does young whippersnappers. Amen? Amen. Remember that. Now, what I want you to see in the Exodus the first thing that happened in verse 7, chapter 14. Look at verse 7 
17. Well, let's just start in verse 14. Thus the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to water and station yourself to meet him on the bank. This is the 80-year-old man. Station yourself on, to meet him on the bank of the Nile. And you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. And you will say to him, The Lord God of Hebrews sent me to say to you, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But hold you not listen to me. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord, behold, I will, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with this staff that is in my hand, and it shall turn to blood. Now, I want you to realize what is happening because in a few moments we're going to read the verse, but I just want to go ahead and tell you what is happening here is not all for Pharaoh's un understanding. It says, so my people can know that God has power. So as we look at each one of these and we think that it's Pharaoh, only Pharaoh's heart is stubborn, it says no. And that's true, his heart is stubborn because the word of God says it. But it says, so my people can know that there's a God with power. It turned to blood. But you know what? The magicians did the same thing with their arts and their cleverness. So with this, in verse 22 it said, the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them. So now look at verse chapter 8. This is the plague of the frogs. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus the Lord says, Let my people go that they may serve me. And so you know, and he says, If you, if you don't, the frogs are going to come on your people and your servants. So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the river and over the streams and over the pools and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand and out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did the same thing with their secret arts and made the frogs come on the land of Egypt. And so it says, and the Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he didn't let them go. But now look at verse 16. We're looking at the plague of insects. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, then become gnats through all the land of Egypt. And the Lord did so. And they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats through all the land of Egypt. And the magicians tried with their sacred arts to bring forth that, but they could not. And there were gnats on man and beast. And then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Listen, there's a virus out there today. And man doesn't know what to do with it. They've got some guesses out there that the malaria tablet might do something. I don't know, but this is I know what is needed. And my hope comes that God can put, turn the Nile into blood, can put frogs coming out of the Nile and pools and streams of water, and that he can cause out of death gnats to come up that the magicians have to say it's the finger of God. What the world needs today is the finger of God. Amen. Where is that finger of God going to come from? It's going to come through us who are his hands, his feet, and his mouthpiece. And that is you and I. So again, we need to go back to 2 Chronicles 17. And remember the necessity to turn from our wicked ways and repent so the Lord can heal the land. We need to go back to Romans chapter 15 and remember this. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace that you may abound in hope because you believe in God. The finger of God has to come to the children of God. It goes on to say now, 
There's a plank of, well, let's see, let's don't jump ahead. Oh, but look at verse 22 uh, of chapter 8. When the, when the uh, insects came, in verse 26, but on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of insects will be there in order that you may know I am the Lord. I am there in their midst. Listen. The insects were over all the land. But in the land of Goshen where the Israelites were, there were no insects. What happened to the world did not happen to God's children. I want us to have the faith to believe that what happens to this world is not going to happen to God's children. Do you follow that? There's where my hope comes from. For I can live in faith without fear because the insects were all over the land, but they did not come where the land of Goshen where the Israelites were. They were on a Sunday picnic. There were no insects to mess with their fried chicken. You see what I'm saying? When you're God's child, there's protection over you. If you're walking with him in repentance and faith and hope, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay in this way. If the virus gets you, you're going to be okay. Because you're going to know this, to die is gain. You're going to know this, that heaven says, says of heaven, there's no sickness, there's no sorrow, there's no death, there's no dying. God is going to wipe every tear away from your eye. You know that whatever comes against you, as you walk in faith, there are people who are martyred because they walk in faith. There are people who get sick even though they walk in faith. I'm never going to forget this last visit I had with Laura Vaden. Laying in a bed. She's had two strokes. She's not upset. She's not angry. She's not mad. She's just rejoicing in the Lord. Lloyd and I were there together making that visit. And she had us sing, God is so good with her before we left. Laying in the hospital, been having two strokes. She's still saying, God is so good. Amen. Her only heart is to go to heaven. But while she's waiting, Everybody that walks in that room, she's saying, God is so good. Praise the Lord. So whatever comes my way, as we exercise faith over fear, I don't say that we are not, it's not possible for us to get something that they've got. But this is what I know. I'm going to operate in faith and not fear. And see the faith of that little lady laying in the hospital with bed saying, God is so good. Let's remember, God is good regardless what happens to us. Live in faith, not fear. Then we come to the plague of bulls. And it will become a fine dust all over the land with bulls breaking out with sores on man and beast through all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from a from a from a a, a, a kill. I'll get that word out. Yeah. A, a, a kill. And and they threw it toward the sky and it became walls, breaking out with sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the bull, bulls. As well, they were on the magi bulls were on the magicians as well as all the Egyptians. And the Lord fa hardened Pharaoh's heart. He didn't listen. Then we go to the plague of hell. In verse 18 of chapter 9. Behold, by this time tomorrow, I will send a very heavy hail such as not been seen in Egypt from, from the day it was founded until now. Then it says in verse 20, Then one, one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock. The one who among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into his houses. 
But he paid no regard to the word of the Lord, left his servants and his livestock in the field. Verse 25, and the hail struck, and all that was in the field, all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, the hail struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree in the field. Verse 16, only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. Are you getting the picture here? Is your hope beginning to build? God's word of history tells us that God watches over his people. The plague of locusts in chapter 10. And that you may tell them in the hearing of your son. In verse 2. That you may tell them in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them that you may know that I'm the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, Marah, Pharaoh was getting, getting messed over. But right there it says to the Israelites, this is what's happening. That you may know by the mockery that's happening to Pharaoh, you're going to know there's a God in Israel. Listen, God can make a mockery of this world. There's one thing that you and I, as we come together and worship, need to declare. We know this. There's a God in Mill Creek. There's a God in this nation. There's a God that we need to point them to. So we literally could be one nation <coughs> under God. So the plague of the locusts. So Moses in chapter 10, 10, verse 13. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. And the Lord directed the east wind on the land all day and all night. When it was morning, the wind brought locusts. But it says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not listen to them. Then there's darkness over the land. There were three days of darkness, according to verse 22. Verse 23 says, they didn't see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Verse 27, was not willing to let them go. Then the last plague is in chapter 11. This plague is when God is going to send the death angel. The only thing the Israelites had to do they had to be obedient in this last plague. They had to take the lamb and sacrifice it, eat of it, leave nothing left over the next day. But out of the basin to where they prepared the lamb, they had, over the, the door and down the two sides, they had to put the blood of the lamb. And that was the sign to the death angel that he would pass over. And the firstborn in his home would not be taken. The Egyptians knew this. They chose not to do it. So the firstborn of Pharaoh's son died. The firstborn of the mill of the slave behind the millstone, her son died. The firstborn of the cat, they died. The cat, whoever the firstborn <laughs> was in that in, in the land of Egypt who didn't have the blood over the door, the firstborn died. In this one, God said, Israel, I've got something for you to do. <coughs> Show me your faith by putting, doing what I've said so you'll be protected. God is saying to us today, show him our faith so that we can be protected. Let your faith Triumph over fear with the hope of God filling you with joy and peace of hope abounds. If anything springs forth from our faith in this circumstances of our world right now is that our hope is in God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we want to be
that beacon of hope wherever we go, whatever we say, whatever we do, whatever we touch. God, I know our faith needs to soar. It needs to grow. God, I recognize the uniqueness of the walk that Jesus had with you. Lord, I recognize that the Word of God says that Jesus said, these things you've seen me do, you'll do greater. Father, I recognize that my walk is not where Jesus was, but I pray that's where you bring me to. I recognize for all of us, our walk is not where you want it to be. That's where I pray you bring the church of the living God to, to have a unique relationship with you like Jesus did so that we can know your power, we can hear your voice, we can claim that oneness, and we can touch this world with your power. Help us in this. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The Word of God in crisis let me stop and rephrase that. The Word of God in life, when everything is going fine, calls just as much from us as the world in crisis should call from us. We should be living in that unique relationship with God, not because of crisis, because of hope that we see in Exodus, because of the state that we find in uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the May, may the hope of God bring into you joy and peace that you may abound. That's something that's to be for our daily life. How we approach life when things are seem to be okay and when the world is in crisis, it should be the same. Amen. Do you follow me? That tells me that I have a lot of growing to do. That tells me that we all have a lot of growing to do. Let us be committed to be those growing men and women and young people in the kingdom of God so that hope will abound every single day from our life to a world that is in distress regardless whether there's a crisis or not. Amen? Amen. Today we offer an invitation. Don't leave that invitation for us, okay? It's a unique day for us. We get to pull things together and watch God work, isn't it? Listen, this is the invitation. Everyone here, our guest, you may be here just because your church is closed. It may be that God wants you to join here. I don't know. That's between you and God. It could be that your hope has kind of been, you know, You've had no hope, so you give no hope to anybody else. And you need to ask God to fill you with hope. Come out here and know and pray and ask God to do that for you. He will. God, the Bible says God withholds no good thing from those who walk righteously. So again, if you have to repent before you ask to fill him with hope, do that. When you get hope, guess what you get? You get joy and peace. Amen? So you can come and pray for that. If you want me to pray with you, I've got my rack here that has all that cleaning uh, sensation in it. <laughs> so I've got my hands clean. Uh, you sanitized your hands when you come in. We'll hold hands and pray. I don't care. Whatever you need. I trust God. My hands are clean. Your hands are clean. We're not going to convey anything. Whatever your need is. What's our hymn of invitation, God? Three or five, I decided to follow Jesus. I decided to follow Jesus. That means with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, with all the hope of God flowing out of you. So, if you need to be anointed, we can do that. If you're sick, we can do that. We can anoint you. If you need to join this church, come. This church will receive you. If you need to just pray and get on the altar for God and be serious with Him, let let him do in your life what he needs to do. He'll call you too, and I don't have to. So stand, let's sing, I've decided to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm.